Okay, this lecture is to go over some of the scientists that helped us discover that DNA was the genetic material. So we talked about Griffith's experiment in class, so I'm just going to really quickly re recapitulate, is that a word? I don't know. Redo it. Um, so remember that Griffith was working with bacteria, two types, a smooth strain that was virulent that could cause disease, and a rough strain that was non-virulent, so it did not, non-disease causing, non-virulent. Okay, so this is just showing you that when you put the smooth bacteria into mice, they die. When you put the rough into mice, they survive. So where his big experiment um, was happening is when he took that virulent strain and killed it with heat. So the bacteria are dead and you can see that when you put them into mice, the mice survive. So the interesting experiment was when he mixed the dead bacteria with the live non-virulent ones and they mixed them in the test tube and when he put that into the mice, the mice died. And when he took out some of the blood from the mice and tried to grow bacteria, he got both the S and the R strains back, which means now all of a sudden he got live bacteria that were once dead. And this was pretty interesting result. And so what Griffith concluded was there was something in the dead bacteria that could transform the rough bacteria into the smooth type because now he got live smooth ones back. The key is that it's something. He didn't know it was DNA. He didn't know what it was because he didn't have the tools of biochemistry at that time. But he knew that somehow genetic information could be transferred. And when this genetic information was transferred, it changed the phenotype, it changed the physical qualities of the R to the S strain. So that was back in the 1920s. A couple decades later, in the 1940s, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty took Griffith's experiment and then had some more biochemical tools to start eliminating the macromolecules. So again, they're going to take the heat-killed S bacteria, just like Griffith did, and they're going to get rid of fats and carbs because nobody thought that those were genetic material. But the question was, was it protein or RNA or DNA? And so Avery McLeod and McCarty had some enzymes that could chew up either protein or RNA or DNA, so they could eliminate those macromolecules one at a time. And so when they added an enzyme that got it rid of protein, so there's no protein in there, but there was still RNA and DNA, and then they did Griffith's mixing experiment where they added those rough cells, they got the S strain back. So just like with Griffith, transformation happened. Same with when they got rid of RNA. So that means there's still DNA and there's still protein. Oops. Added the rough bacteria, got the smooth 
back. Okay, so maybe I will just go to that next one. So they were getting colonies, and remember I told you these are like what you see growing on your food in the fridge. They're little round mounds of bacteria. Oops, they don't do that. Okay. The big experiment, the take-home winner, was when they added a deoxyribonuclease. So you should recognize that as DNA and nuclease is something that chews up or breaks down DNA, so there was no DNA, and they added the rough cells to it, you got no smooth bacteria back. Okay, no transformation. That's telling you that the only way they could get transformation to happen was with DNA. So, nah. So, DNA was the genetic material. And we talked about in class, why my pen does this? <clears throat> we talked about in class that <clears throat> genetic material has to store information. So obviously the DNA had information to turn the R cells into S cells. It has to be able to be replicated, so it was passed down because you got, when you had DNA, you got colonies, and colonies are thousands and thousands of bacterial cells all piled up on each other. So that information was inherited, and it went from um, cell to cell. It's different, it has variation because you have some DNA for R cells, and some DNA for S cells. I can't remember if I got all four, but you can check. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the things I want you to think about is what were their hypotheses? Okay, and um, I did talk with Dr. Duncan, and I totally understand now why you guys don't write if-then hypotheses. Um, I actually talked to Dr. Jones, who teaches GB2, and she does the same thing. So I understand why the if-then is more of a prediction, and the hypothesis can be a statement. What was their independent variable? I want you to think about this for a minute. What were they changing? What were they measuring? And what were some of the things that they held constant? Okay, so questions like this could be your short answer on the quiz. Hint, hint. Okay, let's move on. Hershey and Chase had another experiment that helped us define that DNA was the genetic material. So Hershey and Chase were using a virus, which is called a phage. It's also called a bacteriophage, and that means it's a virus that infects bacteria. So let's take a look at their experiment. So these phage are totally cool, little viruses, and they are made up of protein, and they are made up of DNA. And they have these other parts to them, but those are all protein. Okay. Here in the green is our bacteria. And what phage do is they look like these little lunar landers and they land on the bacteria and they inject their genetic material uh, injected oh my goodness okay genetic material injected into the bacteria All right, so the question is, what is this genetic material? So they can use something called radioactive isotopes. And isotopes just means a different version of the same element, 
Okay, and radioactive means it sends off a bunch of energy, and, and why that's important for science is that we can measure how much energy um, something is sending off, and we can measure it versus something that's not sending off that energy. So for the protein, they used something called S35, and the S is the element sulfur. And some proteins have sulfur in their amino acids. So you can radioactively label, the 35 stands for the radioisotope, sulfur, which gives you, and I write it like this, radioactive proteins. So you can tell where the proteins are in like a mixture. So remember, you can't visualize this. They didn't have good enough microscopes at the time to see what was happening. So they're going to measure where is the radioactivity. For DNA, they use radioactive phosphorus because you know that DNA is a phosphate, sugar, and base. Right? So they can make the DNA radioactive and see where it goes. So let's look at their experiment. So experiment one, they tested proteins. So it's kind of all fuzzy and pink. That's your S35. And the way the experiment works is you take the phage and you grow them in this S35 liquid. And so whenever they're making proteins, they become radioactive. And then you take those radioactive bacteria, um, phage and mix them with bacteria. And so what they're going to do is they're going to inject their genetic material. And then what you do, and this is so cool, is you put them in a blender, right? So what you're trying to do is knock the phage off. So you have these little viruses that are going to be in the liquid, and you have cells that are going to be heavy. And so when you spin them in a centrifuge, so a centrifuge, imagine going on um, like a merry-go-round on the playground, you know, and you get spun and spun and spun and spun. So that's what a centrifuge does. And all the heavy stuff goes to the bottom. And all the light stuff is in the liquid. Right? So you can think about this if you um, mix up a bunch of sugar and water, right? And then you let it settle. All that sugar will settle down to the bottom. Okay? And the stuff that's dissolved is up in the liquid. And so what they found was that the radioactive parts, the proteins, were in the liquid. The proteins did not get into the cells. So the bacteriophage must not have delivered protein as the genetic material into the cells. So let's do the reverse experiment. Okay, now we're going to use radioactive phosphorus. So the DNA is radioactive, and they kind of do a blue glow. You do the same thing, you make radioactive viruses, you infect, you stick them in the blender and knock off those viruses, you spin them around, and now that they saw the radioactivity was in the cells. The pellet just means the heavy stuff. The liquid was not radioactive. That means that the viruses were actually injecting their DNA into the cells to make more virus. So that told them that for these viruses, DNA was also the genetic material. So again, for this experiment, I want you to think about their hypothesis their independent variable, their dependent variable, and their constants. Okay, so now scientists were focusing on DNA as the genetic material. Um, a scientist named Shargaff looked at the amount, our amount of each nucleotide So the amount of A, the amount of G, the amount of C, the amount of T in a whole bunch of different organisms. 
So you can see we have bacteria, yeast or fungi, herring or fish, rat, human. And if you look at his data, what he found was that the levels of A's and T's were very similar. So A was approximately equal to the amount of T. And the amount of G's and C's, especially looking at yeast here, were similar but not the same, right? So A did not equal T equal G equal C. They're not all four the same. Okay. But these two always came out to be about the same number, and these two came out to be the same number. And what we're going to find is this is going to determine base pairing. Right? We talked about A and T base pair and G and C base pair. And now that makes sense because we know that you have two strands of DNA. And so on one strand is A and on one strand on the other strand is T. And likewise with the G and C. They didn't know that yet, but he said, hmm, this is pretty interesting. G's and C's are always similar and A's and T's are similar. Around the same time, people are trying to figure out what is the structure, okay? So DNA is the genetic material. We know it's super important. What does it look like? And so Watson and Crick came up with this famous double helix structure. And they based it on the information from Shargaff to figure out base pairing. And they, um, <clears throat> excuse me, used the information from Rosalind Franklin, who was in Mike Wilkin, Mike, I think it's Mike Wilkins, or is that my dad's friend? I don't know, Wilkins? <laughs> it makes names. Um, he, he was the, is it Wilkins or Wilkinson? I don't have my notes with me. Ah, um, anyways. They use something called X-ray crystallography. Okay. And when they did this X-ray picture of DNA, they saw that it looked like it was in this helical form and that it had evenly spaced um, sides to it. And they also knew some of the measurements And so when Watson and Crick started putting together this ball and stick model, they realized that if the A's and the T's and the G's and the C's base pair, and if you have them running anti-parallel, they will fit into this helical structure. So they took data from Franklin, they took data from Sharga, probably some other data that was out there. Um, people knew what DNA was made up, phosphorus, sugar, um, nitrogenous bases, and they came up with this model in 1953. So now we knew, okay, we are going to focus on DNA. One of their, mo or because their model had these, uh, sorry, I'm not talking very well. Because their model had this base pairing that was happening, it lent the idea that there's a way for DNA to be replicated. Right? That's one of the criteria of genetic information. So Messelson and Stahl looked at DNA replication. And there were three hypotheses about how DNA replicated. It could replicate by the conservative replication, which means the parental strand always goes back together. It could replicate by a, a hypothesis called the di dispersive replication, where each strand, 
is a mix of old and new. So what I want you to see here is, so we have all blue, and now we have some blue and some red, and now we have some more, and you're going to have more red because red represents new, and blue represents the first original strand. I would like it if they kept using different colors so you could see this a little easier, um, but that's not how they did it. So, and I'll tell you why in a minute. <laughs> um, so there, we, we're like, is it conservative? Is it dispersive? Or is it semi-conservative? Which means that each new molecule, molecule is, new DNA molecule, is made of one original and the original restarts every generation, every replication, plus one new strand. So I want you to see the difference between these two. This is a mix, like you're putting some blue here, some red here, some blue here, some red here. This is keeping the strands intact, but just winding two different strands together. So let's talk about how they did that. So they did it with radioactive isotopes again, but instead of two different ones, since they were just looking at DNA, they used nitrogen. Okay. So we know that DNA has nitrogenous bases, so there's a lot of nitrogen in there. And you can get what we call a heavy, because see, it has more neutrons, so it's a little bit heavier on a light isotope. And so when you grow the E. coli, that's their model organism, in the heavy or the light isotope, it gets incorporated to the DNA, and so the DNA strands will weigh differently. So again, they're going to use a test tube, and they're going to use centrifugation. And that's going to separate things based on weight. So heavier towards the bottom, so in this case it would be things with N15, and light towards the top, N14. Okay, so this is what they got. Um, I should not say this is what they got. Oh yeah. So let's look at what they could get based on their predictions. So if it was conservative replication, then after two rounds of replication, and I'm sorry, I should, um, let me clarify. They started with heavy nitrogen. And so this blue band right here is showing you if it was all heavy, what it would look like. This red band here is the light nitrogen, and that's what they switch to, so that's why the new strands in here are red, um, and it would float up higher. So they let the bacteria go through a couple rounds of DNA replication, and when they looked at the bands, if it was conservative, they would expect to have blue band and red band. Okay, just like the originals, or just like the controls. This is a control, sorry. Okay. If it was dispersive, do you see all of these molecules look the same? And they're, they've got the intermediate, because they're not all heavy and they're not all light, so they would have a band somewhere here. If semi-conservative replication was happening, then, notice my nice prediction, then when you got through a couple rounds of DNA replication, you would have some DNA that's all red, right? So some is running just like if it was all made out of nitrogen 14, and some is 
So again, a band, not as heavy as nitrogen 15, not as heavy as this DNA, because it's half light, half heavy. So somewhere in between. So these were the predictions. And let's look at their results. So their results were, and this is the one we're gonna look at, after two generations, they had a light band and a medium band, right? So again, here's the controls like I drew, nitrogen 14, nitrogen 15. And so let's look back again. The only one with a light band and an in-between band is semi-conservative replication. Because if it was conservative, you'd have a light and a heavy, and there's no heavy band here. And if it was dispersive, you would have only one band, and yet they saw two. So 